we have some gorgeous eye candy, a far side blast, and big flares are back. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to Millersville dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is giving sun lovers a treat. As we take a look at our earth facing disk, keep your eyes on the east limb because there's a ton of activity going on there. First watch in the south, you can see a filament launch right here, whoosh, and then another one here, whoosh. These are actually prominences and they don't look all that exciting except when we switch to Suvi's view. Check this thing out. Look at this structure go. My goodness, we back it up a little bit. Isn't that a poster child of what solar storms should look like? This structure is incredibly dense and later we'll talk about the filament that actually caused it because we actually had a peak of it last rotation. But this structure, it's so dense that as we take a look at it in C-Core from GOES, you can see it's almost a partial halo here. I'll back it up just a little bit. Look how bright that is. You don't even need difference images. These are just the raw intensity images. And then that's not the only thing. We had a little eruption that went here, but that's not Earth directed either. So neither of those is. And then we had this structure lift off at another gorgeous display. And in the chronograph, you can see there's the first, there's the second, and there's the third one going off. Not quite as incredibly uh, wide, but still a gorgeous structure and easy to see because it's incredibly dense. And why is that? Why are we seeing so much activity on the east limb? Well, the actuality is that the whole east limb is being involved here. There's a whole network of filaments. And I'll, I'll show them to you. So here's that first one going off. Here's that second one going off. But check out what else is happening. Do you see this big long line right here? This is like a big burn scar right next to that coronal hole. You can watch it keep pulling out like that. Did you see that? Let me back it up a little bit. You can see, see how it retreats. Watch it, watch it play again. Here we go. Whoosh. Do you see all that burning? If you didn't see it all that well, put it up in difference images so you can see it better. So here's the or, or scar from the first one, from the southern one. You're seeing the second one kind of lifting off, but watch all the way in through here. It's incredibly strong. Look at all this. You can even see brightening in this area. So this was a massive burn scar, which tells us that there was a lot more involvement than just one, two eruptions going off. So what I've done here is since we can't really look at the east limb, I'm going to rotate the sun to the east limb, but I'm going to have to patch things together from the last time we actually had a clear view of what was on the east limb before those big eruptions happened. So this right here, this is going to be the view from Earth. And this is a still image that you can see. There's that coronal hole that we can kind of see. But as I rotate to the east limb, what I'm looking at here, this is these are images from basically a month ago, the last time we saw this region. And as it rotates into view, I've kind of stapled them together. Look what we see. Look at this massive, incredibly dense filament. I'm actually glad this one didn't hit Earth because having a filament that dense meant that this would have been a very big solar storm if it had hit Earth. In fact, as you continue looking, you can see this whole network of filaments. You can even see the one that's in the Earth view right now, and then it strains all the way to the back, clear over to here. So it, there's just this pattern work quilt of stuff and it was definitely active you can watch it launch right there so even a month ago we actually did have a lot of activity going on and with that patchwork that meant that we had all of this stuff once once uh, once one bit of material lifted off, the whole network kind of lifted off. And so that's what we're seeing right now. On top of that, we do have some old regions, and we'll be talking more about those in a sec, because some of these regions may be responsible for the big blast that we saw. So now as we return to our Earth-facing disk, take a look at the fringe of the corona all up in here. You'll see it flicker in just a moment. It's not very strong, but you'll see it in this wavelength. 
let's see, where is it? One, two, three, come on, flicker. There we go. That, that flicker was a massive far side blast that we can't see right now. Sadly, Solar Orbiter, which is watching the far side, is not able to limit her any data back to us right now. So we're having to wait because they're in superior conjunction right now, right behind the sun. We just can't get any data. We have to wait till like the 24th to get it. So hopefully we'll see some gorgeous eruptions there. As we take a look once again in Secor from Suvi, you can look at, not that, that's Earthshine. Look at this massive halo right here. Full halo. Let me back it up just a little bit. Once again, an incredibly intense eruption, very dense material coming out because we're not looking at the difference images. So a lot of incredible eye candy that's been going on. And believe it or not, we're not done. We got one more. Check this out. That happened just earlier today. This is a structure. That, hang on where it's coming from this region back here that is just about to rotate into Earth view. Come on, where are you? Hurry up and fire. <laughs> well, we just barely catch it. Boom, right there. This is actually a region that has, it, it gave us a, a M1. Point, what was it, 1.7 class flare? 1.75, somewhere in there. So it was a radio blackout, low level radio blackout, an R1. But this uh, region has uh, is occulted. So the actual flare intensity was much stronger than what we see, but it's being blocked by the limb of the sun here. So we are gonna be seeing a bigger region rotate into Earth view. And once again, look how intense and very dense this structure is when we look in coronagraphs. Again, another poster child for solar storms. We're getting that beautiful, uh, cavity, you know, three-part structure with a, we're looking down the barrel of the slinky. The slinky is going in like this. So it's, it's just, we're seeing these gorgeous magnetic cloud type structures once again. And on top of that, we're also seeing some, some structure in the actual flare that we haven't seen in like 20 years. So here's a close up of the flare right here. Here goes the flare. Here's the post-eruptive arcades, which we're used to seeing. But look at all this stuff. Do you see these kind of, these are actually downflows. We call these super arcade downflows. And again, this is kind of like a calling card of this particular solar cycle. We've been seeing a lot of these super arcade downflows that we, and then we haven't seen these things in like 20 years. So this cycle continues to surprise us and enchant us and remind us of what solar cycles are really supposed to be like. But for those who are working uh, amateur radio, you're going to have to deal with the big flares coming back. They're going to get stronger. We're going to see a lot more of them as uh, we move into the rest of this week. So just hunker down and bear with us. And now taking a look at the far side of the sun, Stereo A imagery is getting better and better because it's moving further and further to the west from Earth in its orbit. In fact, you can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun quite a bit from the side. And as we look at Stereo A's imagery, look at all of these active regions that are on the sun's far side, still in Stereo's view. 4169 and 4172, those are big flare players, and they're probably involved in some of that far side activity that we've seen. But my auto labeler has gone kind of nuts, as you can tell. But as these regions continue to rotate to the far side, we're seeing a little bit of activity, but not too much. I think most of it is still hidden from view. Luckily, as we pull up our JSOC HMI helioseismology far sided viewer, you can see as, well, let me def define it. You can see here in gold is the far side, here in gray is the front side. And as it goes through its whole lit litany here, remember region 4165 and 4168? These were the big flare players last time. Well, these are now on. On the far side, you can see where some of these big players or these big regions are. Here's region 41. Uh, 71 and 4172. These are the regions that have actually, uh, that Stereo just saw. So we're, that's not where all the big activity is. The big activity, as you can see, is all in through here. So definitely region 4168 is still staying alive. We've got a new region near 4161. And then we've got these other regions that are just beginning to rotate into Earth view. That filament that we saw that launched to the south, that was located right about in this area here. So this is going to be over the next week, at least, least is going to be massive stuff rotating into earth view expect that solar flux to rise expect those radio blackouts to pop up and expect the noise on the dayside radio bands to be a bit of a mess it's going to ramp up likely quite quickly once these regions rotate into earth view at all and then we're going to have the next two weeks to continue dealing with them so yes solar storms are on the menu big radio blackouts are on the menu including r3 level radio blackouts i will not exclude those because i do 
think this is that Rosby surge that we've been looking for. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, as well as you drone pilots and aviators, be aware that the big radio blackouts could be with us easily over the next two weeks or possibly more as they begin to ramp up here in the next few days. And now stepping outside to take a look at our current conditions with our global geocron map, the space weather over the past 24 hours or so has been pretty quiet, at least geomagnetically speaking. You can see with the aurora, it's been pretty dim. And this is mainly because we've had some fast solar wind, but the magnetic polarity of this fast solar wind really isn't aligned to give us decent shows. And that's probably good news as things kind of calm down because we had this massive 7.5 magnitude earthquake off of the coast of Argentina. And, uh, uh, and that's been in the Drake Passage. So those of you who happen to be doing some investigation or search and reconnaissance when it comes to that particular earthquake, it's nice to have those geomagnetic conditions being reasonably quiet. In fact, as we take a look at our Roti GPS scintillation risk, you can see that the high concentration of scintillation has actually been occurring mainly on the night side and along the gray line. And that's actually been from about mid latitudes into low latitudes. And that's been over the past day or so but things have been calming down a little bit. However, I don't think they're going to continue to stay that way simply because we do have a mild radiation storm that's beginning to build. So we're probably going to start seeing more scintillation uh, possibilities at higher latitudes. But for right now, things have been pretty calm. Now, as we switch to our DRAP radio blackout uh, threat meter, well, things have also been pretty calm when it comes to radio blackouts. We've only been seeing uh, disturbances up to about 10 to 15 megahertz pretty much over this past day, except as we get to latter, the latter part of the day, we actually did get that M-class flare. You can see it right there. Kind of got us up to about 20 to 25 megahertz in terms of uh, signal degradation. So amateur radio operators, you might have noticed a little bit of something. We take a look at G7IZU and there, uh, the map. We saw just a little bit of a pop, but really not all that much to worry about. However, those radio blackouts are going to become more intense. So if you're on the day side and everything kind of goes staticky or quiet, well, don't look at your rig first, look at the space weather. And now switching to our moon, we are now passing through the new moon phase on our way to a first quarter. And by the 29th, the moon will be about a third illuminated. So you night sky watchers, well, now's a perfect time to catch those dim objects. And you might want to take a look at Comet 2024 E1. This one is passing through the constellation of Hercules right now, and it's a perfect time to catch it if you've got a big scope. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are expecting some fast solar wind uh, starting around the 25th. Now, this is not expected to be a really big deal because this is from that small coronal hole in the north. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions, but we could have up to about a 50% chance of a major storm right around the 25th and possibly in through the 26th. Not expecting a lot of aurora from this one because once again, this isn't a strong, a good polarity uh, coronal hole for us. So Roar photographers, if you're at high latitudes, uh, maybe you should take a look, but it may not be all that exciting for you. Now, mid latitudes, well, we're only expecting unsettled conditions from this fast solar wind. Remember, those big uh, solar storm launches are not Earth directed. So NOAA is giving us about a 35% chance of active conditions starting around the 25th. I've moved that into the 26th, and maybe we'll see a little bit of activity on the 27th. But this is mainly for you amateur radio operators who just don't like the disturbances on the nice side. You're going to be dealing with a little bit of that, but it's mostly a bumpy ride. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the mid 100s for solar flux, and this is going to rise over the course of the week. What also is going to rise is the noise level. We are sitting at minor noise right now on the dayside radio bands, but that is likely going to climb to moderate noise quite quickly over the next few days. I'm going to disagree with, with NOAA this time and give us about a 30% chance of M class flares uh, at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout and a 5% chance of X-class flares at the R3 level radio blackout, just because those regions that aren't on the disk yet are still quite active and could give us big solar flares. Expect those chances to continue to rise over the course of this week. We could see 15% chance of X-class flares by the end of, of or by midweek next week. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect to see the noise and everything kind of tank in terms of decent conditions and expect those radio blackouts to come back.
Now, switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the green for the moment. We're at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators, but we are dealing with elevated conditions right now. It's not enough to be in a storm level, so we're still sitting at S0 levels, but we are gonna be elevated with particulate radiation over the next few days before things calm down. Uh, at right now, I'm giving us about a 5% chance of a radiation storm at an S1 to S2 level, and gonna have that over the next day or two, but then you're gonna watch those risks rise quite quickly, and that's because those new regions are rotating into Earth view, and the further they get away from that east limb, the the bigger chance they have of giving us stronger and stronger radiation storms. So you aviators, make sure you pay attention to your ICAO advisories, including you, the air crew and you high-risk passengers, because we could easily see a radiation storm hit at any time. So the space weather this week is getting pretty exciting. We don't have any big storms to deal with. So aurora photographers, we've got just a little bit of fast solar wind. If you're at high latitudes, you might get a little bit of a show. It might be worth a look. Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, you might want to sit this one out, but you may not have to wait for long because we do have some big active regions rotating into Earth view, and we keep getting these filaments firing over and over again. So solar storms may be on the menu. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders well, things might be a little bit tougher from you. So you're noticing that they're getting a lot more noise on the dayside radio bands and those big radio blackouts are coming back. So just kind of hunker down over the course of this week and possibly next week and just kind of deal with things uh, because it's going to take a little while for things to die down. And now you GPS users, well, we do have a mild radiation storm in the polar region. So that could cause some issues for your GPS reception. And of course, on the day side, we do have a lot of those radio blackouts that are going to be ramping up over the next few days and probably staying with us over the next week. So likely your GPS reception, especially in the polar regions and near dawn and dusk, is going to start getting a little bit dicey. So just hang in there and be sure to check and calibrate your magnetometer often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.